Howdy, folks. This is just a reminder that if you like this content, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially by subscribing. And be sure to hit the bell notification so you always get notified whenever I have a new video. Hope you enjoy this. Welcome to Catholic Answers Live. My name is Edgar Lujano. Filling in for Cy Kellett today. He should be in tomorrow. Today, two hours of an Ask Me Anything. Second hour, Mark Brumley will be joining us. So if you want to ask Mark a question, stick around for the second for the second hour. But today, first hour, we have the one and only Jimmy Aiken, host of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. How are you, Jimmy? I'm doing just fine. How about you, Edgar? Oh, it's a, it's a great day today. I, it's, I'm having a blast today. And because tomorrow's Friday, and once again, Fridays are new episodes of your of your podcast. Yeah. And what do you have coming out, coming out tomorrow? Well, um, we're going to be uh, shifting back to uh, look at a UFO-related topic, and we're going to specifically be talking about the author Whitley Strieber. Um, he wrote a book. Uh, called Communion, in which he described apparent encounters with non-human intelligence. And so we're going to go through the book Communion and talk about his experiences and what might explain them. Okay, great. Is it me, Jimmy, or does it feel like there are, there seems to be more news on encounters with UFOs or a, what do they call it? AI? A, UAPs. UAPs. There you go. Is is, is mm -hmm. it? Is it feel like there's more more out oh, of the yeah. news, or or what do you think? Oh, very definitely. Um, so there, you know, there there have been cycles uh, in history with more or less news coverage of UFOs. They were originally called flying saucers, but then they became called UFOs for unidentified flying objects. These days, they're called UA, sometimes called UAPs for unidentified aerial phenomena, and there have been ups and downs. <clears throat> in the amount of coverage uh, that they've received for some time prior to 2017, we were in a down phase. And then in 2017, the New York Times published an article revealing that the government had a program to study UFOs. And they also, at the same time, released three declassified films. Mm -hmm. They were not high-quality films because the high-quality ones are classified because we don't want our rival nation states to know how good our sensors are. So they released declassified ones, but they released three declassified films of, uh, of UFOs, and that really launched a whole new wave of discussion about this subject in the press. It's gotten uh, traction in Congress with folks in Congress calling for transparency uh, regarding this, and it's been in the news ever since 2017. Well, it's fascinating. Uh, I think uh, ever since that document came out, I've been keeping my, uh, you know, my finger to the pulse a little bit more on it. But uh, mm -hmm. it's going to be interesting. The more that information comes out, how the church will respond to that, because uh, if you know, if, if there's evidence that alien life does exist and they're they're coming to visit here, it starts posing those uh, philosophical and theological questions for us Catholics. It does. The church doesn't have a problem in principle with the idea of extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, they would just be other creatures of God, other children of God. They might be good or bad, but they would be other other children of God like us. The actually meeting them though poses new challenges. And this is not the first time that we've met creatures from another world. Um, it, that's actually happened before. It happened in 1492, hmm. when all of a sudden people from the old world discovered the new world and all the people that were living in the new world, like you and me, we're new worlders. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the new worlders had religious ideas that were not the same as people from the old world, but we, the old worlders then evangelized them, and today the new world is quite thoroughly Christian. So who knows? The same thing might happen again. Who knows? All right, great. Well, if you if you like those kind of topics and you want to listen to a really great podcast, you can listen to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. Uh, and what's the, what's the website where they can find that? Mysterious.fm, like in FM radio. Perfect. Mysterious.fm. And with that, I didn't even get the phone number out, and the lines are already full. So shall we go to the phone calls? To phones? To, to quote SpongeBob SquarePants, I'm ready. All right. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. And with that, we go to John in Texas listening, uh, listening on YouTube. John, welcome to the show. 
Hey, Mr. Aiken, uh, my questions today are, what is your theory of the atonement, and how would you respond to the objection that it's morally abhorrent for an innocent person like Jesus to pay for other people's sins? Okay, well, there are a bunch of different theories of the atonement, and many of them have elements that I think are valid, and so I don't view them as mutually exclusive. Um, you know, there... It, to give a few examples of theories of the atonement that people have proposed that I think can be validly used, um, there is one in the early church fathers that these days is called the Christus Victor model of the, of the atonement, that Christ is the victor who triumphs over the powers of darkness, and there's precedent for that in the New Testament. There's also the um, substitutionary uh, view that was popularized, for example, by St. Anselm of Canterbury, in, in the, I guess, 1100s, that said uh, Christ was a substitute on our part, so God did things with him that compensated for, um, for our sins. There's a variant of substitutionary atonement that I don't favor, which is known as penal substitution, and the idea there is that God punished Jesus in our place. And this, I think, does open itself to, first thing I'd say is there's almost no traction for that in Scripture. There's a, there, there is a single passage that suggests that. It's in Isaiah 53, but the problem is that um, that passage is poetic. And so, I think the problem, I think you can use pun punishment language figuratively or poetically, but I don't think it can be literally true that God punishes or pours out his wrath on Jesus in our place. That would be morally abhorrent. But um, there are other versions that don't involve uh, penal substitution. And so the other versions don't really have the same vulnerability to that objection. Then there's, oh, there's also the medicinal theory that, you know, Christ, by dying on the cross, provided healing for us. Um, and I think all these different models of the atonement have elements of truth in them and can be used as ways of conceptualizing the atonement. I think it was a rich event that can be understood in more than one way. So I don't think we have to settle for just one theory of the atonement. However, I think there is one theory that, to my mind, takes precedence over the others, because it has the best biblical grounded, and that is the sacrifice theory. Um, when we read the New Testament and it talks about what Jesus did, it regularly speaks in terms of him being sacrificed for us, like he's our Passover lamb, and so forth. And I think that the reason that a lot of these other theories came about is because after Christianity got started, we didn't have animal sacrifices anymore. And so people ceased to have a native understanding of what's going on in an animal sacrifice. And so they looked for other ways to articulate what's happening with Jesus because they weren't as familiar with animal sacrifices. The basic principle of a sacrifice is it's a gift. If, you, you know, humans use gift-given as a way to promote good relations— this is certainly true in the ancient world, where if you were going to meet with somebody and you wanted to have good, you know, someone new, and maybe they were even mad at you, you wanted good relations with them, you give them a gift. And even today, dignitaries exchange gifts. Well, when you give someone a gift, you no longer have that gift. You've sacrificed it. You've given it to the other person. And so in the ancient world, <clears throat> where they had an agrarian economy in ancient Israel, um, you know, they they took this gift-giving model and applied it to God. So they'd give God their animals, they'd give God their plants, like the first fruits of their crops, and they would hand these things over to God and in order to cultivate good relations, either to say, I'm sorry for this thing I did, or thank you for what you did, I, I want to acknowledge what you did, or please do something nice for me. And so they use sacrifices for that purpose, and I think that's really what's going on with Jesus. He loved us, 
and he gave his life to the Father as a gift on our behalf to promote good relations between God and us so that we could be forgiven of our sins. God didn't have to do it that way, but by doing it that way, he gave us two very important lessons. One lesson is how much God loves us, that he's willing to do this for us. And the second lesson is how bad our sins are that it took the death of the Son of God to bring this forgiveness about. So we learn valuable lessons because of what Christ did. And that's a general summary of what I'd have to say on the subject. John, thank you so much. We're going to go ahead and leave it right there because it's time for our first break. So if you have a question for Jimmy, you can go ahead and give us a call. There'll be one line open. You can call us at 888-318-7884. That's 888-31-TRUTH. We're here for you. Call now. Catholic Answers Live. Underwriting for Catholic Answers Live is provided by Real Estate for Life. Real Estate for Life connects home buyers and sellers to real estate agents while supporting pro-life organizations. On the web at realestateforlife.org. Underwriting for Catholic Answers Live is provided by Magnificat. Published monthly, Magnificat features texts of daily Mass, prayers, articles, meditations, art commentaries, and more in step with the liturgical rhythm of the Church on the web at Magnificat.com. The most original Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. Have you ever been so grief-stricken? You can't see God in the tragedy. You can't see God in that cross. You're enveloped in that grief. You're enveloped in fear. And God is out the window. You don't see Him standing right next to you. Mother Angelica Live Classics. Every morning, 2 Eastern, on EWTN Radio. Catholic Answers Live, Ask Me Anything with Jimmy Aiken, and the lines are full, so we go right back into it. We're going to go to Andrew in Los Angeles, listening on the Catholic Answers Live app. Andrew, thanks for downloading that app, and go right ahead with your question. All right, so two days ago, I was approached by a Jehovah's Witness for a free Bible Mm -hmm. study, and so I gave him my number, seeing that as an opportunity for evangelization. How do you suggest I approach the situation when I do meet with them? for the greatest chance of evangelization. Well, I think this is a subcase of how to evangelize in general, and one of the best ways to do that is by asking questions of the person that you want to evangelize, because you want to understand their perspective and what they're interested in, and that will lead you to be able to approach them in the most effective way. So don't just assume you know everything this person believes, but ask them questions about what they believe and do so in a friendly way. And that shows that you're a reasonable person, that you're a friendly person, and they're more likely to listen to you when you get around to sharing your view with them. Um, I also would suggest we got a bunch of resources at Catholic.com where you can learn about Jehovah's Witnesses just as background information. So you always want to ask those questions. You don't want to assume that the person you're talking to is a perfectly catechized Jehovah's Witness who believes anything and everything that the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society teaches. They they might be different. They might not have been perfectly catechized, or they might not accept something. Um, But in particular, I'd recommend two resources. Uh, One of them is a School of Apologetics course we have by Trent Horn that is on how to uh, witness to Jehovah's Witnesses. There's also a book by Jason Everett called Answering Jehovah's Witnesses. And there are a few other things, too. So just go to, for example, shop.catholic.com, type in Jehovah's Witnesses, and a bunch of things will come up. Or if you just go to catholic.com and type in Jehovah's Witnesses, you'll get a bunch of free resources. They won't be in as much depth, but they'll be good helps. One thing that I, in particular, recommend in in evangelizing Jehovah's Witnesses is I tend to talk to them about the Holy Spirit, because they are non-Trinitarians. They believe that Jesus is basically the Archangel Michael, and they believe the Holy Spirit is like the active force or power of God. They don't even think the Holy Spirit's a person. Well, um, they're well-prepared 
to discuss their views on Jesus Christ. And so even though there are passages in the New Testament that make it clear that Jesus is God and just directly say that Jesus is God, they're more likely to have answers prepared to try to neutralize anything you say about those passages. They are less prepared if you point out passages to them that indicate the Holy Spirit is a person, because there are multiple passages that give personal attributes to the Holy Spirit. It's not just a force. It's a person. The Holy Spirit's a person. Uh, Paul, for example, in his epistles, talks about how the Holy Spirit knows things and how the Holy Spirit chooses things and how the Holy Spirit distributes spiritual gifts as he will. And in, um, in the book of Acts, we have direct quotations from the Holy Spirit. Like at the beginning of Acts uh, 13, you have uh, the Holy Spirit say, set aside Paul and Barnabas for the work to which I've called them. Okay, we just got the personal pronoun I. The Holy Spirit is using I to talk about himself. And so we, and this is not some symbolic text. Like, if you go to Revelation to do the same thing, they could say, oh, well, this is a symbolic text. This is this is like when it says in Isaiah that all the trees clap their hands. You know, they're not really people. This is poetry. Yeah, but Acts didn't poetry. And so when you got, Acts is a straightforward historical narrative, and when you have direct quotations of the Holy Spirit talking in Acts, that makes it clear the Holy Spirit is a person. And so I tend, rather than trying to, in the first place, engage them on the divinity of Christ, I try to engage them on the personhood of the Holy Spirit, which they're less prepared to talk about. And then if I start to get traction with that, well, then we could move on to say, okay, you need to revisit the personhood of the Holy Spirit. Now let's talk about the divinity of Christ. I think you need to revisit that, too. How's that, Andrew? Really great. Thank you. All right. You're very welcome. Andrew, uh, hang on the line. I want to go ahead and send you uh, our 20 Answers booklet that uh, that Jimmy mentioned earlier on the Jehovah's Witnesses. So, Oh, I didn't even mention that. Uh, oh, that's, you mentioned something else, not that specific yeah. 20 Answers book. Okay. Well, I am That'd be good to send them. Perfect. All right. Well, Andrew, hang on the line. We'll go ahead and get that information from you. Uh, and Sh- yeah, Siobhan will take that information and we'll send that out to you. Uh, with that, we go to Gil in Long Island, New York, listening on Sirius XM Satellite Radio. Uh, Gil, welcome to the show. Yeah. I'd ask you guys to please pray for me. I'm having terrible pain in my eyes for um, mm. some time. I have like an infection or whatever. And it's really difficult to live with. Anyway, um, in James chapter 1, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask of God, who gives generously without finding fault, and will be given to him. Now, when you see the word fault there, is that talking about justification? If that's the case, what's the difference between what Catholics believe about justification and Protestants? I want to hear the Catholic view again, because I know you mentioned it when you debated James White years ago, but it's hard to remember. Okay, well, um, so without finding fault just means God's not going to blame you for not having wisdom. You know, um, it would it, it, if God were finding fault in this situation, then you would say, oh, God, I need your guidance. Please give me wisdom. And God would say, you stupid idiot. Why are you coming to me? You ought to know this already. Okay, that would be fault-finding. And that's what James said is not going to happen. So you can pray to God and say, please give me guidance, please give me wisdom, and God will help you get the wisdom. That He may do it through direct download, you know, through infused knowledge, or he may do it, and this is typically the case, in a less obvious way, by guiding you to find the resources you need to gain wisdom. Um, but he's not invoking justification here. That's Justification is a topic that James turns to in chapter 2 of his book, but, um, but he, this, this passage isn't really related to justification. In terms of, what the, uh, of how Catholics understand justification, I can see on our call screening that the very next caller is going to be asking us about that. Um, also, I didn't debate James White on justification years ago. I debated him 
on justification a couple of months ago. And so if you go to my web page or to my YouTube page, youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken, uh, just you know, search on James White and my two debates I did with him recently will come up and you can listen to the whole debate. The official title is like, how does man have peace with God? But it's really a justification debate and you can get a longer presentation from me of what the Catholic position is there. Gil, thank you so much for your call. I'm going to go ahead and leave that right there and try to get one more call to Larry in Tracy, California, listening on YouTube. Uh, Larry, welcome to the show. Oh, sorry about that. That's you having me on. Go ahead. Hello? Yeah, Larry, go right ahead. You're on the air. What's your question, Larry? Okay. My question was about um, faith alone versus, um, mm -hmm. I suppose, salvation being a lifelong process. And uh, I was okay. asking for, um, I was wondering if you have, like, any, I know you've done debates on this, Jimmy Aiken, especially like James White, and so has Trent mm -hmm. one as well, like when it comes to losing salvation and such. But just, uh, I was wondering, like, what are, like, I guess the strongest arguments against faith alone? Like, are there any, like, found, like, in the Bible? Well, okay, so the first thing I'd say is there has been a unfortunate historic misunderstanding regarding the phrase faith alone. Now, faith alone is not the language that Scripture uses. The phrase faith alone appears exactly once in the Bible, and it's in James chapter 2 where James rejects it as a description of how we're justified. He says that you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. So this is not the language of Scripture. But we have to understand what James says in context. Um, and he's not talking about how you get in to a state of justification. He's talking about growth in justification, how you become more righteous after you have initially come to God and, and been made righteous. And we can tell that, for example, from the example that he uses in James chapter 2, where he talks about how Abraham was justified by works when he offered his son Isaac. Well, that was not when Abraham got saved. Abraham got saved way earlier than that. He also had been justified in, in I mean, the sacrifice of Isaac, that's like uh, Genesis 22, I want to say, and he all obviously had been declared righteous before that, because that happened in Genesis 15, but really he was right with God or righteous even before that, because as Hebrews 11 tells us, it was by faith that Abraham left his homeland to go to the promised land, and that's in Genesis 12. So Abraham, his initial justification was no later than Genesis 12, maybe even earlier than that, and these subsequent cases were instances where Abraham grew in righteousness. So when Abraham, when James says that Abraham was justified by offering his son on the altar, he's talking about a subsequent justification or growth in righteousness. And if you're going to grow in righteousness, well, then you do need to cooperate with God's grace. You do need to do acts of love for God and for neighbor, and that's part of the process of sanctification. But in terms of how you get in to a state of justification, um, even though it's not the language of Scripture, the Catholic Church doesn't have a problem with the phrase faith alone. It's been used by some historic Catholic authors like St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas, but you have to understand the kind of faith correctly. There are different understandings of faith. One of them is intellectual faith, where you just believe the truths of Christian doctrine, and that is not enough to get you into a state of justification. James is clear about that, where he says, you believe that there is one God, you do well, but so do the demons, and yet they shudder at the prospect of God's wrath. So intellectual faith is not enough to save. What about another kind of faith known as fiducial faith, where you not only believe the truths of Christian doctrine, but you also trust God for salvation? Well, Paul makes it clear that fiducial faith is not enough. In 1 Corinthians 13, he says, even if I have faith so strong as to move mountains, so you're obviously trusting God a lot if, he's, if you're moving mountains by God's power, um, that's, it, it's going to profit me nothing if I don't have love. 
So the point that Paul is making is that you need not only intellectual faith and trust in God, you also need love for God. And he makes that point again in Galatians chapter 5, where he says that in Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but faith working through love. And so if by faith alone you mean faith formed by love or faith working by love, that will save you. That will put you into a state of justification. And you know who else agreed with that? John Calvin. And many other Protestants do, too. So if you're talking about faith that works by love, that will get you into a state of justification. And then from there, it's a matter of staying in that state and growing in holiness with God by cooperating with His grace. But to get in, you need faith formed by love or faith that works by love. Larry, we'll leave it right there because you can hear the music. We're going to a break, but hang on the line. We have a couple of 20 Answers booklets that I'd like to give you. Uh, 20 Answers Faith and Works and uh, 20 Answers Salvation. So hang on the line and we'll be right at, we'll, we'll be right back right after this. What was the church like in its infancy? In a word, Catholic. And Joe Heschmeyer has the receipts. In his best-selling book, The Early Church Was the Catholic Church, he gives you the details from the historical records of the first two centuries of Christianity. Right now, get a copy for just $10, plus free shipping if you live in the continental United States. Get more information and order The Early Church Was the Catholic Church at theearlychurchwascatholic.com. Is orthodoxy an alternative to the Catholic Church? In a time of uncertainty for many Catholics, orthodoxy can look like greener pastures. Answering Orthodoxy, the new book from Catholic Answers Press, explains why Catholics who are thinking of leaving need to think twice. There are important reasons to remain in the Catholic Church and convincing answers to Orthodox claims. Order your copy of Answering Orthodoxy today at shop.catholic.com or ask for it at a good Catholic bookstore near you. Why We Are Catholic is the one book you can hand to anyone to invite them into or back to the Catholic faith. With more than 400,000 copies sold, Trent Horn's book has had a number one ranking on Amazon.com for five years running. Now available in softcover, bulk cases, ebook, and on Audible. Find out what the excitement is all about. Order your copies of Why We're Catholic at shop.catholic.com or at a good Catholic bookstore. Visit whywearecatholic.com. Our Lord needs articulate defenders of the truth to spread the joy of the Catholic faith. Catholic Answers Monthly Giving Club, Society 315, helps you fulfill the call in 1 Peter 315 to always be prepared to make a defense for the hope that is in you. For as little as $10 a month, you'll help Catholics grow in faith, bring lapsed Catholics home, and lead non-Catholics to the truth. Go to casociety315.com and join today. Matt Swaim here. Join us for the best of the Sunrise Morning Show with summer reading suggestions, pilgrimage ideas, and tips for incorporating your faith into summer activities. Now back to Catholic Answers Live. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. My name is Edgar Lujano, once again filling in for Cy Kellett's this first hour, we're doing a Ask Me Anything with Jimmy Aiken. It's second hour, if you want to want to hang on with that, because we have Mark Brumley on that second hour. But this first hour, Jimmy, it seems like the phones are always filled, and I don't even mm-hmm. have to give the number out. So that's always great. Cool. <laughs> yeah, great. Well, with that, since they are filled, let's jump back in. Uh, we're going to Ryan in New Mexico, listening on YouTube. Ryan, uh, go right ahead with your question. Yes, thank you so much for uh, taking my call, and peace and grace and love be with you. Um, So I am a devout Roman Catholic of the Church of Rome. Mm -hmm. Um, My bishop, His Excellency Bishop Baldacchino, issued something in the bulletin regarding this other community. This is outside the church. 
and they call themselves Catholic. I don't even like to use that. And they call themselves a church. I don't want to use that term either. But it's the American National Catholic Church, according to what they call themselves. They are not in full communion with Rome. They support abortion. They support same-sex unions. They even call gay marriage marriage when it's not. Um, they support uh, the pill, abortion pill. They support uh, distributing communion to anyone. You could be Muslim you know, according to them and receive it. Anyway, so my question to you is, how do I, belonging to the true church by the grace of God, as a Roman Catholic, and I do understand my church, but how do I align the term Catholic when it's outside of the communion of Rome? Because just because they profess the creed, I don't think that necessarily makes them Catholic because they're so off the charts. So I just want to know your thoughts. To me, I think it shouldn't be allowed that they use the term Catholic. They can't use Roman Catholic, but I guess because of freedom of speech or whatever, they could call themselves Catholic. So how do I allude uh, that definition to that community when I personally believe they are not really true Catholic? Okay, well, the first thing I'd mention is I'd clarify a couple of things you said. You said you belong to the Church of Rome, and you said you're a Roman Catholic. Well, you, you, if you live in New Mexico, you probably don't belong to the Church of Rome. The Church of Rome refers to the church in the city of Rome. And so, even though I'm a Catholic, I don't belong to the Church of Rome because I don't live in Rome. So that's the first point of terminological clarification I would make. The second point is about the term Roman Catholic. Now, the Catholic Church consists of more than 20 different churches that are all united together with the Pope. They are all Catholic. So uh, one of those is known as the Latin Rite of the Church or the Latin Church. It's also sometimes called the Roman Church, and this is most of the people who are Catholic, a large majority, more than 90 percent of the people around the world who are Catholic belong to the Latin Church. And that's the only meaning that the phrase Roman Catholic has is in a Catholic context, is member of the Latin Church. So since uh, you're right, you're here in, in America, you probably are not a member of one of the other Catholic churches, like the Maronite Church or the Byzantine Church or the um, the uh, Chaldean Church. Um, those are all other Catholic churches. You probably are a Roman Catholic, you know, based on your name and what you've said. But don't think of the term Roman Catholic as a synonym for the term Catholic, because it's not. Roman Catholic means specifically member of the Roman Rite, or member of the Latin Church. Then there's the broader question you ask, how do we, how do we define the term Catholic, given that there are other people who claim to be Catholic but are not part of the Catholic Church? The answer is whether or not someone is in communion with the Pope. If someone is in communion with the Pope, then they are a Catholic. And if someone is not in communion with the Pope, then they are not a Catholic, even if they insist on using the term Catholic for themselves. And I agree, it would be less confusing for folks if they didn't use the term Catholic for themselves, but that's actually what they're after. They're trying to make people think they're Catholic when, you know, even if they say, well, we're the American Catholic Church or we're the old Catholic Church, they're trying to lay claim to a heritage ecclesiastically that they're actually no longer part of. And so, um, so yeah, on, you know, because of freedom of speech, the Catholic Church doesn't have any ability to compel them not to use the term. But from a Catholic perspective, the people who are properly described as Catholics are the people who are in communion with the Pope. And that's the basic difference. All right, Ryan, thank you so much for your call. We're going to go ahead and move on. We go to Claire in California, listening on the Catholic Answers Live app. Claire, welcome to the show. Hello. Um, so my question for you guys is, um, why didn't Jesus solve all the problems of his time? And then if you have time, I also have a follow-up, which is, okay. if he met us where we were at with sexism, why can't we apply this to priests and or female priests and pastors? Okay. In regard to the first question, um, 
this is part of the this is part of the problem of evil. Uh, why does a good God allow evil? And why did not Jesus fix all the evils of the world immediately upon his first coming is a subcase of the problem of evil. Um, I did a talk about uh, the problem of evil and specifically the problem of suffering, but I've also talked about the problem of evil before. You can... Uh, I have a general talk on the problem of evil at shop.catholic.com. I have a sub-talk that covers most of the same ground but focuses a little more on the problem of suffering on my YouTube page, where you can watch it for free at youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. So I won't go through everything about the problem of evil at the moment, but you can watch those for more information. What I would say is even though there are mysterious aspects to the problem of evil, as the Catechism says, faith gives us the assurance that God would not allow any evil unless he was going to bring about an equal or greater good out of that very evil. And it all, we also have indications from the New Testament that there's a kind of overarching plan that God is working with the world, where he will eventually solve all of its problems. But that happens at the end of history, and God has delayed that fixing of all the problems of the world in order to allow more people to come in to the Christian faith. So if Jesus had just solved every problem of the world in the first century and introduced the eternal order right then, well, one of the problems of the world that needs to be fixed is death. And so if he if we had the resurrection of the dead and the final judgment and the institution of the eternal order at the end of the first century or in, in AD 33, you and I wouldn't exist. None of the rest of world history would have happened. None of the people who have come into being since then would ever have been born and ever had the opportunity to meet Christ. And so by delaying the fixing of the world's problems, that actually creates the opportunity for many, many more people to come into existence and get to know God and get to know Jesus and get to become part of his plan. And so that's at least one of the goods that God is bringing out from the fact that he allowed the world to continue to exist with its problems and not fix them all immediately. So there's still aspects of mystery to this, but God wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have allowed the world to continue in its broken state unless he had some good that was greater that he was going to bring out of its broken state. And in this case, we're fortunate that we have at least an idea of what one of those goods was, namely the fact that you and I and everybody else we know got to exist and gets to know God. Um, in terms of, um, of, of sexism and uh, female priests and so forth, there were female priests in the ancient world. You know, there were, for example, in Rome, there were the Vestal Virgins. They were a group of priests who worshipped the goddess Vesta. And there were other priestesses of other religions, too. This was not a new thing. And yet, Jesus chose to have his ministers be men. Now, we know that even though men and women are equal in God's sight, and St. Paul is very explicit about that, he says, in Christ, there is no male and no female. You know, we're all equal before God, regardless of our sex. There are differences between the two sex, between the two sexes. And for a reason known to him, Jesus chose to have his ministers be male. And so the Church has felt bound by that decision. And consequently, the Church, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, has concluded that this is not a matter of sexism. I mean, nobody has a right to be ordained a priest. It's a gift. And the Church feels it's obliged to honor the choice that Jesus made in having only men be appointed to be ministers. Now, most men are in the same boat as most women, as all women, 
in this situation. I'm not a priest. Edgar's not a priest. Most most Catholic men are not priests. So this is a special gift that is only given to certain people, and the Church feels that it is um, bound by the decision that Jesus made in this regard. That doesn't mean there aren't other roles for women, included consecrated roles, like becoming a nun, becoming a sister. Um, there are ways for women to specially consecrate their lives to God and serve God in specially consecrated ways. It's just a different role than the role of the priesthood. Claire, thank you so much for your call. We're going to go ahead and leave that right there because it's time for our final break. Uh, there'll be one line open, so if you want to give us a call and uh, ask a question, you can reach us at 888-318-7884. Hello, this is Archbishop Salvatore Cordelioni of San Francisco. Keep your dial tuned to Catholic Answers Live. In Morse code, the sequence SOS is a distress call. It's been said that it stands for Save Our Souls. Well, right now our world is in big trouble, and we're putting out an SOS call for help. Will you answer that call? St. Paul Street Evangelization, a Catholic nonprofit, has hundreds of teams who share the good news with souls who don't know Jesus. Catholic Answers is supported in part by St. Paul Street Evangelization. Visit streetevangelization.com to get involved. He is only one of four popes honored as the great. Matthew Bunsen and the Doctors of the Church. St. Leo I was pope at a time when Roman civilization was being overrun by barbarian armies. He stood as a light in the darkness and even saved the city of Rome from destruction by Attila and the Huns. Leo died in 461. For more about the Doctors of the Church, visit doctorsofthechurch.com. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. You know, one of the things that really brought me to the, well, I guess uh, intrigued me about the Catholic faith more and more was the early church. And one of the greatest, I think one of the greatest resources we have right now on the early church is Joe Heschmeyer's book that really breaks it down easily. And you can pick that book up of, uh, at Catholic uh, shop.catholic.com today. It's a, it's a great resource. Fantastic for you uh, to check it out. Uh, it's just 10 bucks plus free shipping. So go ahead to shop.catholic.com. Check out that book. It's a really fascinating book. And I think uh, if you look at all the details that he breaks down, it's it's almost like a, oh, no kidding, no kidding that the Catholic Church is the one true church that, that Jesus Christ founded when you look at the early church. So once again, shop.catholic.com, just $10 plus a free shipping on that for U.S. Uh, US people. Jimmy, shall we return to the calls? Because lines are sure. Good. All right, here we go to Benny in Naples, Florida, listening on YouTube. Benny, go right ahead with your question. All right, yes, thank you for taking my call. So I was speaking with a friend of mine who's not Catholic, and I was pointing out some Bible verses to try to get my point across. I was practicing my apologetics that I learned from you guys. And he had said, I kept pointing out like some gospel phrases, and he kept saying that those weren't for us, that the books of Romans through Philemon are for us, and that the rest of the Bible is for the Jewish people. And mm -hmm. I didn't understand. It kind of left me flabbergasted a little bit. And um, I was just wondering about, you know, I've always believed that the distinction between Jews and Gentiles is, is Jesus kind of got rid of that, and it's no longer, it no longer exists, but I'm just confused. I was wondering if you could shed some light on that for me. Okay, so the difference between Jews and Gentiles it still exists. A, a Jew is anybody who belongs to the Jewish people, and a Gentile is anybody who doesn't. And there are still Jews today, and there are consequently still Gentiles today. Now, J what was new with the New Testament wasn't that Jesus did away with the distinction between Jews and Gentiles, but he included Gentiles into the family of God, whereas previously the Jewish people were uniquely God's chosen people, and now God has a, a new family that includes both Jews and Gentiles. So, and they continue to have their own identities. One of the things, if you read later in Romans, like in Romans chapter 11, Paul makes it clear that um, 
before the second coming of Christ, there will be a notable major conversion of Jewish people to the Christian faith. That's one of the signs, one of the few signs that uh, predicts the second coming. So Jews and Gentiles still have their identities, but we are both included in the family of God. In terms of your friend's idea, now I don't know your friend and I'd have to hear more about his views, but it sounds like your friend is um, is what's known as a hyper-Calvinist. There is a group of folks who believe that different passages in the New Testament do not apply to the entire church age. And so they will say things like, well, the Gospels, that was for an early, for the earliest part of the church age, but it's not for us. And they'll even say things like parts of the book of Acts or the whole of the book of Acts. That's not for us. That was for some early Christians. And I'm sorry, not hyper-Calvinist, hyper-dispensationalist. And then there is there are Paul's letters, and maybe they're for us. Or some hyper-dispensationalists will say, no, even Paul's letters aren't. It's just the the um, the pastoral letters, like First and Second Timothy and Titus, those are the only parts that apply to us. And frankly, this this system is not native to Scripture, and it is not believed by the vast majority of Christians, no matter what their persuasion. The vast majority of Protestants reject this. The vast majority of all Catholics and Orthodox reject this. Academic scholars who don't even have faith, you know, would say, yeah, this is not the teaching of the New Testament. The New Testament does not divide history up into these ages that have rigid barriers that carve up the New Testament and make them apply to different times. Um, so that's a basic explanation of where this guy's coming from in terms of how to argue against his position. You know, that's something that I would need to know more about exactly what he says, but what I would, and I, so I can't really give you a short course on that at the moment, but what I would suggest is that you Google hyper dispensationalism. That's the term. And, um, and look for resources online that, uh, that, object and give arguments against hyperdispensationalism. Benny, thank you so much for your call. Uh, we move on to Matthew in Indiana, listening on YouTube. Matthew, welcome to the show. Matthew, are you there? Oh, yes. I'm so sorry. Not a problem. Go uh, right ahead. I have a question for you, Jimmy. I, I, uh, I read your article on... Um, on uh, the resurrection accounts and how they fit together. But I was still having just a little bit of trouble with the exact timing of, uh, it seems like when you look at the Greek, the timing of when the women went to the tomb on Sunday morning vary a little bit. Uh, I have a little bit of trouble with that. And if they are different, can the biblical inerrancy still be you know, maintained? Yeah, biblical inerrancy... <laughs> can definitely still be maintained, but biblical inerrancy has to be understood in terms of the level of approximation that the biblical authors are trying to give us. So, I don't know if you've ever seen Star Trek, the original series, but you might see, if you're watching Star Trek, the original series, you might see a scene where Captain Kirk says something like, Mr. Chekhov, when will we arrive at the planet? And Mr. Chekhov says, oh, we'll arrive at the planet in four hours. And then Mr. Spock might say, correction, Ensign, we will arrive at the planet in four hours, one minute, and 5.07 seconds. Okay, well, who, who, is, who is right there? Well, at the, really, both of them. Both Mr. Chekhov, who just said four hours, and Mr. Spock, who said fractionally more than four hours, are correct. What they're doing is they're given an answer to different degrees of approximation. Mr. Chekhov is approximating to the hour. Mr. Spock is approximating to the microsecond. And we all, we all use approximation it's in varying degrees. For example, Edgar... What is the numerical, the decimal expression of the number pi? 3.14. 
Ah, no, it's three point one four one five nine six. See, oh, wow. we just gave <laughs> we just gave pi to two different degrees of approximation, but we're both correct. And in fact, you have to use uh, approximation when you're given a decimal expression to the number pi because it's an irrational number, and there is no end to the digits that are involved in pi. So you must use approximation in that case. And the truth is, we all use approximation anyway. So what the Gospels all agree on is the women went very early on Sunday morning. And even if there's slight differences, this is within the degree of approximation that the biblical writers are trying to give us. They didn't have watches. You know, they, they didn't have iPhones they could carry around and look at the exact time. So within the degree of approximation that we can expect out of this text, they actually all agree on the same thing. So I don't see a, a problem here for inerrancy. Matthew, I'm going to go ahead and leave it right there because I want to try to get one more caller. So with that, we go to Jeff in Houston, Texas, listening on 1430 AM. Jeff, go right ahead with your question. Hey, Jimmy and Edgar, thanks uh, so much for your time and all you do. I had a quick question on Jimmy's perspective or interpretation between the difference uh, uh, between Catholic value and Catholic virtue. Okay, what's the question? So what what do you see, how would you define uh, Catholic value? Uh, Because I think it's more clearly that we know what Catholic virtue is. Okay. Well, if you're just looking for definitions, I would say that a Catholic value, in if we're talking moral values, is a principle that Catholics hold that expresses some degree of either positivity or negativity regarding particular things or activities. So Catholics, for example, would say families, you know, having a family— is a positive thing, but it's not a mandate that you have a family. On the other hand, not murdering innocent people, well, that's a mandate. So that has an even higher degree of value than having a family. Similarly, uh, alcoholism would have a negative value. It would have uh, Catholics would place a negative estimation on that. But alcoholism is not as bad as murdering innocent people. That has an even lower negative evaluation. So I would say in terms of values, there's essentially, you can think of it as a spectrum. It may not, that may not exhaust the way to think of it, but basically it's either a positive, negative, or neutral evaluation of a activity or a thing. Virtues are the implementation of positive Catholic values. So if you if something has a positive value from the perspective of Catholic faith, then when you implement that, you're exercising a virtue. So having a family is a good thing. Well, then that's a virtue when you have a family. Not killing the innocent innocent people, that's a virtue when you don't kill the innocent. Similarly, the flip side, if you um, if you become an alcoholic, that's not a virtue, that's a vice. And if you kill innocent people, that's an even worse vice. So I would say that there's a reciprocal relationship between values, which can be positive or negative, and then when you implement the positive values, that's virtue. When you implement the negative values, that's vice. How's that, Jeff? That's perfect. Thank you so much. Appreciate your your help. All right. Thanks, Jeff. No problem. Thanks for your call. Um, All right. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, for your call. Uh, We're coming close to the end of the hour. So if you want to hang on the line or or give us a call, uh, Mark Bromley is going to be on in the second hour. You can reach us at 888-3187-884. That's 888-31-TRUTH. And uh, once again, this hour has been with Jimmy Aiken, the host of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. And uh, just a reminder, in case people tuned in halfway through the show, what, what you have coming up this week or tomorrow? Tomorrow we're going to tomorrow we're going to be looking at the claims of Whitley Strieber, a popular author on things like UFOs. He claims to have had numerous encounters with non-human intelligence. He described them in his book, Communion. And so I read Communion, and we're going to be going through the experiences he reports and considering what could explain them. Do they do they have to have 
uh, represent uh, encounters with extraterrestrial intelligence, or could they be something else? All right. Well, there you have it. If you want to take a listen to that tomorrow, you can find that on Mysterious.fm or wherever you find podcasts. Just type in Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. Jimmy, thanks for uh, thanks for an hour. This was fun. My pleasure, Edgar. All right. God bless. And and before we go, just one more reminder that if you like what you've watched, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially by subscribing. I'm trying to grow my channel, and I'd really appreciate your help. Thank you, and God bless you.